Listen to this. Two chimney sweeps come out of a chimney. One's all black, the other's all white. The question I'm asking you is which one will go wash himself? Well, the black one, obviously. That's not much of a riddle. I'm sorry, but you were not made to understand the Talmud. Why not? You're not thinking. The one who came out black sees that the other came out white, so naturally he believes he too is clean and white, whereas the one who came out white sees that the other is black, so he believes he must be just as black himself. You mean that the white one will go take a bath, not the black one? No, you're still not thinking. The white one who thinks is black sees a black one who thinks is white, whereas the black one sees a white one who thinks is black. In that case, then neither of them take a bath. Why shouldn't both of them go take a bath? I'm asking the same question. You're asking the same question. You say, come on now, since when has a chimney sweep ever come out of a chimney or white? Huh? That's a good question. No, the Talmud is not just a book of riddles. It's much worse than that, or much better. It depends on your point of view. Orthodox Jews look upon the Talmud as their daily bread. Almost as soon as they are weaned, boys begin to sample these writings, the purpose of which is to reveal the true meaning of the Bible, teasing sense from its paradoxes and contradictions. If Adam had no earthly parent, did he have a belly button? Did fish survive the great flood? Why did Jacob's angels need a ladder to reach heaven? If God could create the world in six days, why couldn't he do it in one, or in an hour, or better yet, in a single instant? These are riddles of another kind. The Talmudic method for understanding the Bible consists of challenging and questioning each and every biblical assertion. The word Talmud is short for the expression Talmud Torah, which simply means the study of the Torah. Torah is the Hebrew term for the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. As for the Talmud, it is composed of volumes containing centuries of rabbinical discussions about how to interpret contradictions in the biblical text. For the rabbis, the Bible is simply an immense metaphor, a source of wisdom which, when distilled by their understanding, provides instructions for daily life. In other words, they had to invent an amazing analytical structure to succeed in deciphering the laws of Kashrut from the myth of the forbidden fruit, the foundations of linguistics from the story of the Tower of Babel, and the principles of human freedom from the tale of the Exodus from Egypt. Without the Torah, there would be no Talmud. But without the Talmud, the Torah would be mysterious indeed. In the synagogue, it is customary to open the Torah scrolls three times a week and to bring the biblical text to life by reading them. But another way of giving life to the text is to discover its various interpretations. That is the purpose of the Talmud. For centuries, sages have been adding written interpretations to the Talmud. Thus, rather than a single book, it is a series of several books which have accumulated over the course of time. A book inside a book inside a book almost infinitely. A book without a single author. A book to which all the sages of all time have contributed as authors. Every field of human knowledge is covered, for the Torah itself encompasses them all, though that may not immediately be apparent to the reader. The Talmud says, My teaching is like the sea. To learn to swim, you must dive in. The same is true of the Torah. Only he who plunges in, braving the risk of drowning, can learn what it is. A notion of light. This is how the Talmud describes the Torah. The Talmud is immersed in the Torah, exploring its depths. As it probes and questions, 
It finally touches upon the fundamental subjects of the meaning of life, the links between the instant and eternity, and many other essential issues and values that philosophy and science later examined in their own way. But unlike philosophy and science, the Talmud is not austere. It also knows how to laugh at itself. Let's back up a minute. The white chimney sweep sees a black sweep, who sees a white sweep who thinks is black, and the black one sees a white one who sees a black one who thinks is white. It's not so simple, is it? Wrong! It is simple. The white sweep can hold up his hand and see that it's white, and the black one can do the same and see that his hand is black. Do you mean to say that the one who sees his hand is clean will not go and bathe, and the one who sees his hand is dirty will? Too easy. You may be clean yet still want to wash, and you may be dirty yet not feel like washing. Look at me, for instance. Well, I know. In the year 70 of the Common Era, Titus had torn down the Temple of Jerusalem, and Roman troops had been occupying the holy city of the Jews. Most of the sages had fled to the north, to Galilee, near the town of Tiberias. The Romans had become determined to put an end to Judaism, to avert such a catastrophe, a group of sages initiated one of the most remarkable developments in the history of the humanities, the elaboration of the Talmud. Their guide was Rabbi Judah Hanasi, Judah the Prince, a widely revered leader of the Jewish community of his time, a wise man among wise men. Today, his grave lies in the heart of Galilee, the cradle of his life work. Until then, Generation after generation of wise men had been learning by heart the dialogues of the ancient masters, adding their own commentaries as they went. This collective oral history was always in danger of being scattered and lost, especially as the volume of commentary was ever growing. To avoid such a tragedy, Rabbi Judah Hanasi took radical action. He recommended that nearly two centuries of memorized oral teachings be compiled as a written document. He dictated the framework, form, and boundaries of this first sum of knowledge and named it the Mishnah. Mishnah means repetition, as the mission was essentially to repeat in writing the wisdom that had grown to large to be memorized. The immense task was only completed two centuries after his death. The Mishnah makes up the first part of the Talmud and was finished in the year 220 of the Common Era. The Talmud is organized according to the structure Rabbi Judah Hanasi gave the Mishnah, six orders covering the entire spectrum of human knowledge. These six orders are divided into 73 tractates, themselves divided into chapters, of which there are some 523. Every aspect of life is covered. God made the world in six days, and Rabbi Judah sorted it into six orders. Six orders like the six cardinal directions. Six orders like the six days of the creation. Six orders which distill all the knowledge ever conceived by the human mind. In six orders, the Talmud is an endeavor to encompass all that is knowable, just as six directions define the boundaries of the cosmos. Six manuscripts became the basis for the laws and customs of the Jewish people. Six orders which offer nothing less than a user's manual for life in the world. Zuraim, the order of seeds, wherein the laws of germination and thus the principles of vitality in all its forms are discussed. Muid, the order of festivals, wherein the laws of time, the calendar, the Sabbath and other ceremonies are discussed. Nashim, the order of women or wives concerns the laws governing matrimony, family life, and society in general. Nezikin, the order of damages, discusses issues related to crime and punishment of various degrees of gravity, as well as idolatry. Kodashim, the order of holy things. The laws of the Temple of Jerusalem, its measurements, architecture, organization, types of offerings and service. Tehorot, the order of purities, a discussion of all the laws related to ritual purity. But the elaboration of the Talmud was an ongoing project. The sages continued their task of questioning the writings. Gradually, 
The Mishnah was supplemented by new commentaries, which accumulated over the centuries. This body of the Talmud is called the Gemara. Gemara means completion in Hebrew. As time went on, this commentary became so long that it now makes up over 90% of the Talmud. Thus, from the 3rd to the 7th century of the Common Era, the Talmud, according to the six orders set forth by Rabbi Judah Hanasi, evolved into the form it has today. The Mishnah, written in Hebrew, followed by the Gemara, written in Aramaic, the language spoken by all the Talmudic scholars of the time. Following the Roman invasion, many Jewish scholars settled in the kingdom of Babylon, which explains why the Talmud developed simultaneously in two separate places, Galilee and Babylon. This resulted in the compilation of two Talmuds. The one which evolved in Israel is called the Yerushalmi Talmud, or Jerusalem Talmud, and the one written in Babylon is called the Talmud Bavli, or Babylonian Talmud. The chief difference between them is in their method. The Jerusalem Talmud emphasizes the conclusions of the sages with regard to property law, whereas the Babylonian one prefers questioning. Ultimately, the method of questioning prevailed, chosen by later Talmudic scholars who are still studying the Babylonian Talmud. For millennia, wherever Jewish children were to be found, they grew up learning the art of the question. The Talmud is the quintessential book of the question. Who has questions? the rabbi asked one day. I have so many answers. He was referring to his Talmud. The Talmud does far more than answer questions, however. It forges a dialectical attitude which may sometimes lead to unexpected results. The white one may be on his way to sweep another chimney. After all, he may not be going home, so why should he go wash then and there? Nevertheless, a person can feel like bathing even if he does not see that he's dirty. He may just feel dirty. Yes, a person can feel dirty. You can feel dirty all the time. That's not what I mean. You're talking about a neurotic chimney sweep obsessed with his own cleanliness, not his appearance. Obviously a thought from the Babylonian Talmud, because Yerushalmi doesn't waste time on such nonsense, as you know. Well, then perhaps the white one comes from Jerusalem and the black one comes from Babylon. It took six centuries for the Talmud to come into the world. Six centuries to succeed in condensing what would become the most unusual compendium of unending dialogue on every subject under the sun. Even today, each page of the Talmud is made up of two parts. The text from the Mishnah or Gemara is printed in the center. It is surrounded by various commentaries which were written later and have become essential to understanding the text. Students in today's yeshivot, or Talmudic schools, perpetuate the dialogue between rabbis of Galilee and Babylon and their successors. <laughs> Within a yeshiva, the art of debate is an essential tool for understanding the codes for daily life. But first and foremost, the Talmud develops the student's analytical skills, sharpens his critical sense, and broadens the field of conjecture as much as possible, always with the ultimate goal of shedding greater light on thinking and its contradictions. Thus, the students discover the intellectual prowess deployed by the Talmudic scholars who clarified the relation to daily life and ethics of biblical tales full of seeming paradoxes or anachronisms. The biblical text is also perceived as a metaphor because Hebrew is a language of multiple meanings. A single word can open many doors and lead to several levels of interpretation. Whether Adam and Eve had belly buttons doesn't matter. In Hebrew, Adam means, I am of the blood, and Eve, I am alive. Beyond the encounter of man and woman, it is the story of the encounter of flesh and vitality. 
How vitality penetrates the body through the blood. Everything I eat becomes blood, the Talmud says. And oddly enough, the source of the Jewish dietary laws lies in the story of Adam and Eve. The first thing they did after they were created was to eat, like newborn babies, soon after they leave their mother's womb. Eating implies attention to the foods one eats, the Talmud says. Thus, the simple story of Adam, Eve, and an unknown fruit is the key to the dietary laws of Kashrut, which go beyond mere nutrition to define man's bond with the world. So, face to face, the apprentice scholars argue their opinions, dueling with words, sharpening their rhetorical skills, and perpetuating the tradition of controversy as if it were a sort of game. And it is. Wait just a minute. How can one chimney sweep come out black and the other white? It's a false assumption. Both must be black with soot. No, sir. If the first one picks up all the soot on his way out, the passageway is clean for the one behind. You mean it's clean for the second sweep if the first one comes out black and the second white? That's too easy. Do you think the Talmud would ask such a subtle question to reach an answer as simple as that? I don't think anything. I'm trying to understand. You're trying to understand? I repeat. Two sweeps come out of a chimney. One's black, the other's white. Which one will go wash? But the true greatness of this book is that it is also the story of a people. The Talmud tells of the Jews, and the Jews tell of the Talmud. The book grew as the Jewish diaspora continued, as the history of the Jewish people proceeded. The process of inventing the Talmud is mingled with what it contains, its manuscripts, its identity. The history of the Talmud must be interpreted as the history of a people. From Sinai, Moses received the Torah. From Sinai, not at Sinai, the Talmud points out. As if Sinai itself instigated the gift of the Torah to Moses, and from Moses to the Jews. Moreover, there is a subtlety in Sinai which is more than a mere mountain. There is a tight bond between the words Sinai and Sinat, the latter meaning hatred. The Talmud says from hatred Moses received the Torah. What does it mean? Here is an appropriate interpretation. The Torah is needed to counteract the hatred that arises between men. The Torah, the Book of Peace. Davening, a perpetual rhythm, rolling and undulating. Generation after generation of pious Jews have beaten an unending tempo, swinging with a pendulum which marks out time as the pages of the Talmud are studied and turned. The Talmud is a flame which penetrates the mind and throbs within the body, lending it a perpetual, immutable, eternal to and fro motion the rhythm of life like the beating of a heart. According to Talmudic anatomy, these oscillations promote both concentration and memorization. One direction opens the valve, the other one closes it. The opening activates understanding, the closing ensures memorization. In the 10th century of the Common Era, the decline of Babylon, the land of exile from Roman Palestine, forced the Talmudists to emigrate to other countries. As they wandered, they wrote thousands of new works, continuing the endeavor of the first sages. Jewish thought was continually being enriched by the questioning of those who were taking part in its perpetual invention. Throughout the ages, the Talmud remained an unceasing creative process. Having traveled from Jerusalem to Babylon, the Talmud began another long exile. 
Constantinople, Salonika, Corfu, Messina, Syracuse, the northern coast of Africa. Jewish communities were founded throughout the Mediterranean, on the shores of Italy, slowly taking root along the Adriatic coast, reaching French shores and the Iberian Peninsula, always equipped with their precious book as the most prized possession. The Talmud soon became the repository of Jewish memory throughout the diaspora. The act of studying the book proved to be the only comfort to a persecuted and homeless people. Indeed, the pleasure of study made up for the suffering of exile. Attachment to the book could compensate for a lack of attachment to the soil. For a people still awaiting their promised land, the Talmud became a gratification. Thus, the part of 10th century Rhineland known as the Golden Triangle, located between Speyer, Walms and Mainz, saw the founding of the most important Talmudic academy since those of Galilee and Babylon. Prestigious scholars gravitated to the center of learning. Their reputation was so brilliant that they attracted he who would become the most illustrious of all, Rashi. Born in 1040 in Troyes, France, Rabbi Shlomo Benitsa Katsarfati, known as Rashi, traveled to Volms as a young student and lived there for several years. Rashi became the most popular of the rabbis of his time, but he was also the most phenomenal. His vast knowledge and valuable contributions to Talmudic interpretations were unique. Here in the yeshiva at Volms, he studied and prayed until he became a prominent scholar. According to legend, this was his chair. It is carved into the stone of the yeshiva walls, the way his teachings are carved into the edifice of the Talmud as we know it today. There would be the pre-Rashi Talmud and the post-Rashi Talmud. His impact was so profound that even today, his commentaries are never separated from the original text of the Talmud, a book inside a book. Rashi's commentary is printed in the margins around the text of the Mishnah and Gemara, which are located in the center of each page. It has become an indispensable guide to the Talmud, clarifying a corpus which has become somewhat difficult to follow after so many rewritings. The immense erudition of Rashi, the child prodigy, was recognized by the Jewish and non-Jewish scholars of his time. He contributed to the recognition of the Talmud's spirit of universal humanity. As a wise old man in Troyes, Rashi tackled another endeavor. He founded an important school. His disciples elevated Talmudic questioning to such a high degree of erudition that today's students still refer back to their writings. Rashi took the eternal Talmud and made it universal. But suppose it's dark outside, as Rashi says. The white sweep can see is white, but the black one will have trouble. However, if he can't see himself, he may just conclude that he's black, but the white one may too, which means there's no point in putting off washing until tomorrow. That's exactly what Rashi said. Do you think so? Well, frankly, no. An ocean of light. If the Torah is the reflection of divine light, the Talmud channels the light and tames it. Just as the sea tames the fire of the sun. To immerse oneself in the Talmud is to tame the divine fire, but that won't necessarily save you from earthly fires. In the year 1240, Nicolas Donat, a French Jew who had converted and become a Dominican monk, reported to Pope Gregory IX, denouncing errors and fallacies he blamed on the Talmud. In Donat's opinion, the Talmud contained blasphemies against Christ, the Virgin Mary, and the angels and saints of the Church. Gregory IX, who had already set down the rules for the Holy Inquisition, felt it was his duty to pursue the heretics and stamp them out. The Vatican sent an explicit request to the King of France, Louis IX, known as Saint Louis, to put an end to Jewish perfidy by eliminating every copy of the Talmud. Saint Louis ordered the burning of all the Jewish manuscripts. The first bonfire of the Talmud took place in Paris in 1244. 
Many more book burnings were held in following years as the royal decree was enforced. On May 15, 1248, the Talmud was solemnly condemned by a court as the blasphemous work of the devil. The repression which followed was so violent that the French school of Talmudism was wiped out. The Talmud resumed its wanderings, this time reaching Spain. Since the 9th century and the decline of Babylon, Spain had been ruled by Muslims, yet every one of its great cities was home to a group of prominent Talmudic scholars. Córdoba, Toledo, Sevilla, Barcelona, Granada, they each had thriving Jewish communities and thus the study of the Talmud flourished with them. As attested by the Cathedral of Córdoba, built in the heart of the old mosque, Moorish Spain is a symbol of harmony between religious communities. Under enlightened Umayyad rule, Muslims, Christians and Jews coexisted peacefully. In the shadow of the mosque and the church, in the narrow streets of the Jewish neighborhood, a new light was about to shine. Moses Maimonides rose like a star in the firmament of the golden age of Andalusia. Born in Córdoba in 1135, he became the most highly revered intellectual of medieval Spanish Judaism. His works, including the Guide for the Perplexed, have taken on great importance in the eyes of all scholars, Jewish, Muslim, and Christian. His code of law, the Mishneh Torah, was a major influence on the writings of philosophers from every school of thought, as well as religious erudites from every creed for generations. Of his Mishneh Torah, Maimonides said, he who reads my book will know everything of the Torah and its commentaries. Rashi in France, Maimonides in Spain, were both inspired by a vision of universalism. Both of them wanted to take the wisdom of the Talmud out of the confines of the synagogue and make it available to all. However, whereas Rashi concentrated on clarifying the method, Maimonides chose to ignore it, emphasizing the conclusions of the ancient sages instead. This yielded a practical Talmud. My goal is to be as concise as I am complete, Maimonides wrote, so that the reader can be steered directly to all that has been instituted and confirmed by the Talmud without dealing with all the discussions of the sages which may trouble his reasoning. I am doing all this so that my book will be the only book a person needs. An astronomer, mathematician, and botanist, royal physician to Saladin, Maimonides devoted his life to imparting wisdom to the people of his time, great and humble. His genius revealed the universal nature of the knowledge in the Talmud. He is buried in Tiberias, where the Talmud itself was born. Thus, Maimonides is reunited with his illustrious forebears. It was not until the early 13th century that the Christian armies rallied their strength to reconquer Spain and drive out the Moors. Spain's unification was the result of the marriage of Isabella the Catholic and Ferdinand of Aragon in 1474. In January 1492, the religious cleansing began and Muslims were banned from residing in the land. Caught in the torment of the Inquisition, which the Vatican had revived, the Jews were driven out of Spain the same year. They fled, saving their only true wealth, the Talmud, from the disaster. Unwelcome in Spain, the Jews and their Talmud sought homes elsewhere. Venice offered them its hospitality. Why did God disperse his people all over the world, the student asked. So that the light of his Torah could illuminate every dark corner, the sage replied. And for bringing light, Jews are hated, persecuted, and driven out? 
the student retorted. The greater the light, the more painful is its birth, replied the sage, his eyes filled with tears. Although the Doge of Venice was relatively independent of the Roman Church, the first ghetto in history was located in Venice in the late 15th century. Ghetto, a Venetian word, came from the Italian verb gettare. It was where the foundries discarded their scrap metal. The Doge of Venice gave the Jews permission to settle there. Venice began to produce its own crop of Talmudic scholars. Venice is a landmark city in the Talmud's history, for it was here that the full text of the Talmud was printed for the first time. The year was 1519, 5279, according to the Hebrew calendar. The Vatican, which had made the presence of the Talmud in Italy punishable by the rigors of the Inquisition, had no power over the Doge, who allowed Jewish books to be printed on his territory. Page after page of the Hebrew script was printed on the presses of Daniel Bomberg. It was one of the most colossal undertakings in the history of printing. It amounted to nearly 10,000 pages, which were carefully proofread by prominent Jewish scholars, aware that the book they were producing was unique, as vital as it was miraculous. It took five years of devotion, from 1519 to 1523, for the Talmud manuscript to become a printed document. Bomberg spared no expense in his effort to ensure that his edition of the Talmud would be perfect, and he succeeded. The Bomberg Talmud remained the single exact reference for nearly four centuries. All of the printings which followed, the most famous among them being Basel, Pizarro, Amsterdam, Munich, Frankfurt, and Krakow, up until the definitive 19th century Vilna edition, were based on Bomberg's work. Bomberg's painstaking typesetting work became the gold standard for the layout of the pages of the Talmud in the era of the printing press. As a result, its appearance is sober, simple, and classical, devoid of flourishes, going straight to the heart of the text according to a special geometry. The Bomberg edition settled the page layout. The text of the Mishnah and Gemara are printed in the center of each page in square characters, while the commentaries by Rashi and his students are visible in the margins in semi-cursive script. In the 16th century, with Bomberg, the Talmud became a work of art. Nevertheless, creeping censorship by the Vatican forced Bomberg to close his printing business and leave Venice in 1546. The church, which could not criticize the Bible without criticizing itself, made the Talmud the target of its hostility. In the eyes of Rome, the Jews were no longer the people of the Bible, but the people of the Talmud, teachings damned as anti-Christian and diabolical. The church's arguments against the Talmud and its contents were groundless, of course. The Talmud sternly condemns idolatrous religions, but never designates Christianity as one of them. Yet, the church was determined to prove Jewish perfidy. In the second half of the 16th century, the church, committed to the Counter-Reformation and embattled by the liberalism of the Renaissance, required strict observation of the faith. It engaged in active persecution of the Jewish community, accusing it of anti-Christian sentiments. Many monasteries still possess copies of Jewish books confiscated at the time. The Church has always been wary of Jewish books. However, the Vatican scholars, unable to read Hebrew or interpret the text, soon decided to escalate their battle against the Talmud. In 1553, the Pope published another order to destroy Jewish books by the flame.
All the Jewish homes in Rome were searched, and a fire was built on Campo di Fiori for the auto de fe. The date was September 9, 1553, Rosh Hashanah, the day of the Jewish New Year. A few weeks later, in Venice's Piazza San Marco, on October 21st, a Shabbat day, the papal nuncio recorded this event. A good fire put an end to the blasphemy. Over a thousand copies of the Talmud were burned. The history of the Talmud is also the history of its struggle to survive persecution. Fifty years later, the Talmud was to be reborn from its ashes. Its history reflects that of the Jewish people, who have always successfully resisted all attempts to destroy them by assimilation, conversion, or physical annihilation. Is a white sweep who thinks is black whiter than a white sweep who thinks is white? That's like the question about the candle. Does it burn brighter at night in a dark cave than outdoors in the sunshine? We were assuming that night had fallen, in fact. How can sweeps do their work at night? Why shouldn't they be allowed to work at night, you might ask? Aren't they men of free will? What does free will have to do with it? There are laborers who do their work honestly, and to clean a chimney properly, they must do it by daylight, that's all. Let's say that they started in the afternoon, were running late, and when they came out of the chimney, night had fallen. So it must be winter if the sun sets so early. Exactly! Who sweeps their chimney in the winter? Autumn is chimney sweeping time. It's called peel pool, an obsession with logic which leads to the absurd. The art of peel pool was invented in Poland under the influence of the scholar Jacob Polak, who lived in Krakow around 1500. His teachings emphasized the need to analyze every point according to the finest and most subtle dialectics to argue each and every contradiction and assertion. Peel pool comes from the Hebrew word for pepper. You sweep your chimney before winter in the autumn. Snow may fall before winter comes. Both sweeps are black, but one is white with snow. But when snow gets dirty, it turns black, does it not? So black snow may be hiding the white sweep, and white snow may be hiding the black sweep, exactly. So which one will go and bathe, exactly? Pilpul aroused controversy among Talmudic scholars. One of them lived in Vilna, the Jerusalem of the north, Eliyahu Kramer, who lived from 1720 to 1797, is still venerated today as the Geon, or genius of Lithuania. His school attracted many followers. He was so devoted to the study of the Talmud that he never slept more than four hours a night. To keep himself awake, he attached his pious to the ceiling and kept his feet in a basin of icy water. The great integrity, remarkable intellect, and subtle analytical skills of the Geon of Vilna put him in a class of his own among rabbis. Tirelessly, he applied his intelligence to understanding the text and subjecting it to serious examination without indulging in Pilpul's game of dialectics, which in his opinion was closer to nitpicking than to true thought. The Geon of Vilna was widely revered throughout Eastern Europe. The Talmudic schools he founded became the model for those of today, and he influenced generations of illustrious scholars. The definitive edition of the Talmud, the one used as a reference today, is the version printed in Vilna in 1870. Its margins contain the commentaries of many scholars, and it is a digest of the teachings of the modern masters, enlightened by the erudition of the Geon. The generations of students which followed thus had a much more efficient resource than the many which had preceded them. Poland, Austria, Hungary, Italy, Spain, England, Germany, France, Lithuania, the Ukraine, no European country was deprived of the invention of the Talmud. Thus, for nearly eight centuries, the Talmud dwelt in Europe. It was as familiar to Jews in the shtetl and the ghetto as it was to those in capital cities and centers of intellectual life. During all that time, the Talmud was the focus of intense attention. 
Schools and commentary flourished, shaping the Jewish culture that was handed down to us in modern times. Modern times are synonymous with America, and the Talmud left the old world for a land which appeared to be full of promise. Starting in the late 19th century and up until the 1920s and 30s, huge waves of Jewish families crossed the Atlantic to the New World. The Talmud now had an American outpost. Naturally, one of the first needs attended to by the Jewish community was the publication of its study books. It had always been a way of making a new land a home, temporary or not. The rabbis were aware that in America, the temptation to assimilate was much greater than in Europe. The Talmud was liable to be abandoned by the young. To prevent this disaster from occurring, the first Talmudic schools established in America were modeled strictly on those of the old world. The Talmud settled itself in a surprisingly changing society. At the dawn of the 20th century, would the Talmud adapt to its times, or did the times adapt to the Talmud? To answer this question, simply listen to the dialogue of the sages. Somehow, their words have always foretold historical events. For two and a half years, the school of Shammai debated the school of Hillel on the subject of mankind. Shammai's followers argued that mankind would be better off if he had never been created. The school of Hillel said the opposite. Mankind's creation is a good thing. In the end, the scholars were able to reach the following consensus. Mankind would be better off if man had never been created. But since he exists, he should be virtuous. With anti-Semitism on the rise in Europe, one of the only alternatives available to the Jews was to be virtuous in the United States. But some scholars cautioned against leaving Europe for the unknown vices of the new world. Condemned to live in hiding, confined in ghettos where they were subject to starvation and disease, with the Talmud as their only comfort, the fate of the Central European Jews in the 20th century is a powerful argument for the opinion that mankind would be better off if it had never been created. In any case, Nazism certainly lent support to Shammai's proposition. Hope has always been the foundation of Judaism. In fact, it is especially appropriate for a Jew to hold out hope when a situation is hopeless. The roots of Jewish hope are even stronger than those of the world's absurdity. Resurrection in a world where absurdity has no place being its most unexpected example. The Talmud tells the story of a Roman emperor who was killing off the Jews. Before sending a sage to the executioner, the emperor called him in for questioning. I don't understand how you Jews can believe that the dead will be resurrected. The sage's youngest daughter answered for him. She told the Roman, Before, you didn't exist, but now you do. That doesn't surprise you, but I find it amazing, and I always will. Today, you exist, and you are amazed that one day you may exist again. That doesn't surprise me a bit. The Talmud includes vivid descriptions of the resurrection of the dead, but its own existence is proof of resurrection. It has survived every attempt to destroy it. And again, despite the scope of the disaster, the people survived, and with them, their book. As the Talmud says, we learn more from the dead than from the living, because the living convey the teachings of the dead, and in doing so, bring them back to life. In Hebrew, a cemetery is called Beth Hahaim, the home of the living. Although in appearance, Europe's Talmudic history lies in the past, the tombs, like open books, 
like tables of the law stuck in the ground, still bear witness to the wisdom of the ancients. But intelligence lives on. It is still there, ready to be born again, even on other continents. After the war, Talmudic scholarship would again flourish, especially in the United States, thanks to the Daf Hayomi program. If one reads one page per day, it takes a little longer than seven years to read the 2,711 pages of the modern edition of the Talmud. This is the discipline now followed by all the world's Talmudists worthy of the name as part of the Daf Hayomi program, that is, one page a day. Rabbi Meir Shapiro of Lublin in Poland initiated the practice of reading one page of the Talmud per day on September 11th, 1923, Rosh Hashanah. He interpreted the Talmud as a spiritual home where all Jews could dwell together at the same time throughout the world by studying the same text. In 2005, over 46,000 people gathered at Madison Square Garden in New York, connected by satellite to other Jewish communities in the world, to celebrate the 11th completion of the study of the Talmud, 11 seven and a half year cycles. A new type of Talmud scholar is beginning to rise, resuming the ancestral ways. Meanwhile, high in Manhattan skyscrapers, businessmen, lawyers, and bankers are choosing to devote themselves to a daily Talmud reading before returning to the office. The exercise is a source of energy for them. Talmudic wisdom is capable of providing answers to dilemmas raised by modern times. Isn't it said that God made the world in six days and rested on the seventh, when today the whole of mankind works for six days and rests on the seventh? Is that not a sign of Torah's timelessness? asked the Talmud. From the very beginning, American Jews took an active part in constructing the new world. At times, they paid the price of assimilation and lost their Jewish identity. Nevertheless, they've always maintained their ties to their ancestral lands, returning to Europe regularly. Nostalgia was not the only factor. They were also driven by a real need to meet those who managed to preserve the Talmud from assimilation. Of course, assimilation had been a problem in Europe. Scholars left the yeshiva for secular studies, yielding to the temptations of philosophy, literature, art, and science. Many of the children and grandchildren of Talmudists pioneered discoveries in fields unrelated to Judaism, mathematics, logic, physics, and even psychoanalysis. Writing to Carl Abraham, Sigmund Freud mentions Talmudic atavism, which probably gave many of their colleagues a taste for psychoanalytic theory. What's the difference between a Talmudist and a psychoanalyst? One generation, they used to say. Today we can reverse the question, what's the difference between a psychoanalyst and a Talmudist? Another generation. And yet, that was the generation who had had the Talmud torn from its hands and thrown into the fire. Once you start burning books, you are on the way to burning people. People were put into trains that became their graves. But trains can be put to much better uses. One of the carriages in this train becomes a Talmudic Academy every morning during the ride from Long Island to Manhattan, where the commuter students no doubt include many children of Shoah survivors. The Talmud stimulates the intellect. It inspired the study of law, trade, psychoanalysis, and many other fields of knowledge. Apparently, it has something for everyone. Possibility of Tahora. In other words, if a woman had a cesarean section and she didn't plead, she would be Tahora. If she was walking around, then we it's wouldn't consider right, we wouldn't consider that a problem. How do we know that woman inspires man? 
from what is said, God said to Abraham, listen to your wife, Sarah. From this, the wise men deduced that if women were to study, they could go much further than men. Is that why he dispensed her from studying? Modern times will have brought the Talmud more students. Jewish women, who had always been held at some distance from the Talmud, are now applying their minds to study. Every day, more women enroll. Their elders were satisfied with hearing about it from men. All Jews have Talmudic scholars among their ancestors. Freud mentions the Talmud of his fathers. Karl Marx came from a line of over 14 generations of distinguished Talmudists. Einstein parodied the Talmud inadvertently by discovering the laws of relativity. Kafka regretted not having studied it. It's impossible to count the founders of modern thought who owe the Talmud something in some way. Even if the Talmudic tradition has been abandoned at times, denied or banished, the Talmudic process has continued to unroll. In New York, Art Scroll editions are tirelessly translating. Rabbi Sherman is among the artisans who have lent their translation skills to the latest reinvention of the Talmud. Today, there are English, Russian, French, and Spanish versions of the Talmud. As if the latest phase in the book's evolution was its accessibility to all, even those who have never learned Hebrew or Aramaic. This is the goal that Adin Steinsaltz, founder of the Israel Institute for Talmudic Publications in Jerusalem, set for himself. He is the author of a new, annotated translation, the purpose of which is to point out the relevance of the Talmud today. Enlighten the greatest number. To achieve this goal, the Talmud is using new paths, which neither Rabbi Judah Hanasi, nor Rashi, nor Maimonides could have ever envisioned. In its own way, the Internet expresses the spirit of Hanukkah. Hanukkah, the festival of lights. Every winter, Jews light candles for eight nights as a symbol of the hope they share for a better world. A world made better by knowledge and wisdom, which must be removed from its secrecy and shared. Like the flame of the Hanukkah candle, the wisdom of the Talmud has always lit the darkness for Jews. Day starts with night. As it is said, there was a night. There was a morning. It was the first day. The same goes for our own lives. It starts in the darkness of a mother's stomach and continues in the light of the world. But some say that night is the world in which we live. Morning will be the future world. And this dark world makes it so that we are like blind men, searching for the slightest glimmer of wisdom. A single little light sparkling in the shadows. Throughout the history of the Jewish people, the Talmud has been the spark of insight which preserved their clairvoyance through every ordeal. In any case, the Talmud calls blind men those who can see clearly. What if they were blind? Blind chimney sweeps. On the other hand, there's not much to see in the chimney. What if the question was about two blind men? One is dirty, the other one is not. Which one will go bathe? But then the Talmud would have said blind men, not chimney sweeps. Yes, but it's too simple to answer that the dirty one is going to bathe. The student must infer that the Talmud is implying that they're blind. How can they clean a chimney if they have no sight? Haven't you ever heard of a blind pianist? Two chimney sweeps lay in the piano? No, but if two blind men can play a Beethoven duet, there's 
there's no reason they couldn't climb up a chimney, then why wouldn't the question be, after the concert, which pianist will go bathe? But that is the question, in fact. The thing is, the chimney sweeps and blind. Ever heard two chimney sweeps play the piano? No, but I'd love to. That reminds me, I knew an antique dealer in a trumpet duet. Which trumpet player went to bathe? That's a good question, insofar as neither of them is blind, right? By the way, let me ask one thing. Have you ever seen a chimney sweep? No, you should. Thank you.